Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar for today. We have Dave Taylor talking about winter wildlife. My name is Stephanie Keeler. I'm the Community Program Coordinator here at the Riverwood Conser Conservancy. I hope you're doing well today and staying safe. Um, before we get started in today's presentation, I just have a couple of housekeeping notes for everyone. Tomorrow, we also have a webinar called Food, Climate, and You, and that is with the Mississauga Food Bank and EcoSource. So we'll be talking about eating green and fighting climate change within our own communities. As well, we are celebrating Valentine's Day and our former Mississauga Mayor Hazel McCallion's 100th birthday with a dinner special from Capra's Kitchen. You can order a Valentine's Day meal through the Riverwood Conservancy, which will be directed to Capra's Kitchen's website. And a portion of those proceeds will go back to protecting nature at Riverwood. Uh, for all other events that are happening in February, please visit the riverwoodconservancy.org. And if you have the financial means to donate, we would greatly appreciate it to keep our programs up and running. Um, if you have any questions today, please type them in the Q&A chat in Zoom. And if you are watching on Facebook Live, I will try to get to those as well. And today we have our wonderful Dave Taylor, our resident wildlife photographer and wildlife expert here. Also the author of over 40 books on wildlife and ecology. And Dave has also produced educational videos and material about wildlife for school curriculum. And speaking of schools, if you are watching with the school today, if you could just type in the chat how many of your students are watching with us. And also you can email us um, to let us know how many students are watching. That would be greatly appreciated so that we know all of the viewers that we have. And that is all for me. I will hand it over to Dave for the rest of the presentation. Thank you everyone for joining us once again. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate the introduction. So um, today we're gonna to talk about wildlife in uh, the winter. And I know that for some schools, it's uh, particularly uh, a good time to talk about because they're thinking about how animals are surviving. And I hope that you see as we go through this talk, that there's a lot of correlations between the way we survive and the way wildlife survives. So we're gonna talk about coping with winter and let's start with the snowy owl. If you live in Southern Ontario, you may very well see one of these large white owls uh, hanging around your, your park or the, on your drive or whatever. Uh, these owls are here, we call it an er eruption with an eye. Uh, these eruptions happen yearly. Sometimes they're very big, sometimes they're pretty small. I think this is just an average one. And what it is, is the birds move south from the Arctic into the southern part of Canada and actually into the northern part of the United States. And they come down here to feed. One of the best places to look for these birds is along the lakeshore. Um, now you might think it's strange for a bird to migrate south to Ontario, especially today when the temperature is hovering around minus seven degrees. We have this real chill. But in fact, there are a number of species that do do this. These are long-tailed ducks. These are males in the foreground, from the background, and females in the foreground. And they are in their non-breeding plumage. Now they breed in the Arctic. And for them, the Great Lakes is a vacation haven. There are hundreds of thousands of these ducks along the lakeshore. And if you go down to the lakeshore, you'll hear them. They make this sound, it sounds like they're saying, okay, okay. And you just have to listen just about anywhere. There are more of them for some reason this year over towards the Hamilton area in the GTA than we're seeing in the Mississauga, Toronto area. But they are there, and there are lots of them. I was photographing a flock of about a thousand just a couple of days ago. These birds are in their winter plumage. Most birds change from their breeding colors, the bright colors of the spring. They change into a more duller color. And for the old squaw or the long-tailed duck, the old squaw is its old name, the long-tailed duck when it's in breeding plumage, looks like this. It's almost the opposite 
of its winter plumage. And they're here in the Great Lakes because the Great Lakes have lots of small crustaceans that these birds feed on. And it, for them, this is paradise. And you might think that the water would be really cold, and it is. But as long as it's not frozen, it's above 32 degrees. So it is actually warmer, or zero degrees. It's actually warmer there in the water than it would be on the land. Some birds can't go very far. This is a ptarmigan. Now, we do not have ptarmigan in the GTA. But ptarmigan are a good example of a type of bird that you find up north. In the winter, their feet grow more feathers, so they're walking on snowshoes. And they change from a brown color to a white color. And this, of course, is really good for camouflage. They can blend into the snow. They're harder to see. And there are several species of animals that do this. Not all of them are birds. This is a snowshoe rabbit. Now, a snowshoe rabbit is usually the color that you associate with most of the rabbits you see around Mississauga. And I'm calling it a rabbit, but it's really a hare. And there are differences between rabbits and hare. The hares tend to uh, give birth in different places. They're younger, more developed than the rabbits. But the snowshoe, as winter comes on, it turns white. Now, the reason they turn white has to do with a chemical change in their body. And that chemical change is called photoperiodism. And it has to do with the angle of the sun. As the sun doesn't get as high in the sky anymore, the angle of the light going through the rabbit's or hare's eyes changes. And that change causes their body to chemically change and they lose their darker colored fur and they become white. And if we were to take a snowshoe hare from the Arctic, Northern Ontario, down to South America, even though the seasons are reversed, this same phenomenon would happen. They've actually done that to test it. This is our native rabbit, the one that you see around here. And this is the cottontail. The interesting thing about cottontails is there was a period from about, oh, 1400 to Oh, 1850s, 1860s, where there were no cottontail rabbits in southern Ontario, but they had been here prior to that. And the reason they disappeared was we had what was called the Little Ice Age. And it was a period of time when Ontario got much colder. So the cottontails that lived here died out. And as the temperature warmed up again, even though it's cold today, the average temperature has warmed up and the cottontails moved back in. So they have records that I think the first cottontail killed by a hunter in the 1800s was almost like in the 1880s. And now they're everywhere. Now, this cottontail is doing something very important. It is coping with the winter cold by burrowing into the snow. We think of snow as being really cold, but if you can get snow piled around you, it will help keep your body warm in. And so this is what this cottontail is doing. It's using the snow to keep himself warm. It's also getting him out of the wind. Some birds like the osprey that are born here, hatched here, they fly south to the Gulf of Mexico and they will spend two or three years down there without ever returning to Ontario. So they're a migratory bird, but their migrations as young birds take quite a while. So a young bird born last April or May will then be down in uh, the uh, Gulf of Mexico area until probably 2003, 2004. And then it'll come back and hopefully find a place to nest. Other birds fly down only for a short period. One of the reasons that birds migrate from here is they don't have any food. So the osprey who is a fish eater when there's ice on the lakes, can't get the fish. And so he leaves. The old squaw, the long-tailed ducks, they can get food in the lakes because they can dive down and there are places where we heat the water with uh, our various thermal plants where these crustaceans live and the old squaw can feed there, but the osprey cannot. I do apologize for saying old squaw. 
I'm an old school birder and they've, they've been changing the names of a lot of birds in the last 20 years. One bird whose name has not changed is still the bald eagle. Bald eagles stay in Southern Ontario. Now they've made a big comeback because of conservation efforts. They stay in Southern Ontario because they can feed on carrion, those animals that die, either because wolves bring them down or a car hits them or they starve to death. So these bald eagles, they hang around. There is some migration, but generally speaking, most of our birds of prey that you see outside when you're driving around, as a storm front comes, comes through, they will move south with it, but then they will return once it starts. So they're going back and forth, maybe several times across the lakes. Uh, there are places where hunting takes place where it is quite easy to see these bald eagles. They uh, are doing quite well. Now, if you're a bird and you're cold, what you do is something we do. I'm sure when you get to go outside for recess, if you're a student or you remember being a student, you would bundle up. And often we would look like snowmen because we were so puffy in these jackets. Well, the reason you wear a puffy jacket or layers is to keep warm air in. So when a bird like these blue jays, this was about minus 30 degrees when I photographed them, they fluff themselves up and by getting their feathers sticking out, making the birds look fatter, what they're doing is they're trapping that warm air and they're able to survive the really cold, cold temperatures. Now, you might say, but they've got bare legs. Yes, but they're able to constrict the blood flow in their legs so that they do not lose heat. They were keeping their warmth in. And you'll see all sorts of birds. If you have a bird feeder, you'll notice how fluffy the chickadees are, the, how fluffy the cardinals are. And if you go outside with your friends, you'll notice how fluffy they are. In fact, a lot of our really good jackets are filled with bird feathers down to keep us warm. I want to talk a little bit about trees. We have two types of trees. We'll call them evergreens and those trees that deciduous that lose their leaves. Deciduous trees, because of the cold temperatures coming and the lack of sunlight, again, photoperiodism, they lose their leaves. We get the fall colors and the leaves fall to the ground. And they also take all of that sap that they've produce, been producing and they store it underground. That sap is rich in sugars and when the warm weather comes, it helps draw the sap back up and the tree comes back to life. Well, another way of coping with temperatures, rather than losing your leaves to protect your moisture content, you have needles and needles are hard and they lose very little moisture to the wind, to the cold temperatures. And the advantage pine trees have, conifers, is that they have <clears throat> their needles, the green chlorophyll that they need to produce food already on. They don't have to regrow them again. <clears throat> so they get a head start when the warm weather starts to come. So plants have adapted to this. Lots of plants just go dormant and they go to sleep and they store energy in their roots. <clears throat> Some plants die and they put out seeds that can overwinter, and those seeds will start to grow once the warm temperature comes. If we get a warm spell, like we often do, that can be disaster. If, it, if you're a gardener, you'll know, you'll see plants coming up in March, and then snap, and that's not good for the plants. Some animals can't migrate, and they can't find food. The black bear is a good case in point. So it cannot travel south and there's no food. It's not equipped like a wolf to travel over the country hunting animals. Wolves are, are better adapted for that. They have paws that can go on top of the snow. Um, they're thinner. They don't require as much plant food as a bear does. So wolves do fine, but bears, not so much. So the black bear, when snow starts to come, they seek a den. And this is 
if you're ever walking, this is how you spot a den. Now, you'd be very lucky. This is the breathing hole of a den. Even though bears are in hibernation and their breathing rate has slowed way down and their body temperature has dropped way down, they still have to exchange air. So that air has got to go out someplace or you get a buildup of carbon dioxide, which would suffocate the bear. So this is their breathing hole. It's usually because of the way the air circulates up and melts it. It's quite a distance away from the entrance to the den. So if you jumped on that, you probably wouldn't be jumping into the bear's den. Although in point of fact, I would not suggest you jump on it. Inside the den, the bear is lined with material, leaves and branches, and twigs that it's scraped in. And the den is really small. I've crawled into a couple of dens uh, as part of the research I was doing for a book and I can't fit into them. And you think a bear would be much bigger than me, but I was able to squeeze in, get one arm out and no further, my head and one shoulder. And we're, what we're doing is the bears had been uh, tranquilized and I was gonna pull the bear cub out, but that's all I could do. I couldn't get in any further. And the reason the dens are small is the more space you have around you, the more heat you have to do. So this notion of bears living in big dens, in caves, it does happen, but it doesn't happen very much in the far north because they need to keep that body heat in. In fact, some bears out in the Rockies, the male bear, especially male grizzly bears, they just go to sleep when the snowstorm comes and they let the snow cover them, which is very compact, and they sleep the winter through until it starts to warm up again. This is the bear in the den, fast asleep. But bears, when they hibernate, even though they're um, in a deep sleep, are not as in as deep a sleep as some animals. And you can wake a black bear up, and maybe that's not something you want to do. Uh, they can rouse themselves. They can do something that other animals that hibernate don't do. Bears actually give birth in the den. And they give birth to babies that are about this big. And the babies, they're able to find the mother's nipples because as the nipples swell with milk, they're giving off heat. And it's that heat that attracts the baby bears. Now, why give birth to a baby in a den? Well, they're giving birth to these babies prematurely. And by giving birth to them prematurely, if they are out wandering around like other animals do, it would be very unlikely the baby would survive. But in the comfort of the den, these little cubs do very, very well. And by the time they emerge three months later, they're able to frolic and run and keep with the mother and climb trees and do all sorts of things. It's a strategy that bears have adapted. But not all bears have adapted it. Polar bears do not hibernate unless they're giving birth to cubs or they have young cubs. Male polar bears stay active all winter. And remember, food is one of the things that drive this. Well, there's more food available in the winter on the sea ice in the form of seals. So polar bears do not hibernate, the males don't, and they go wandering up. And you might say, well, do bears hibernate in the summer if there's no food? Suppose there's a drought. And the answer is no, they can't. They don't. They're not designed to do that. One of the most famous hibernators, and we'll be celebrating his day very shortly, is the groundhog. Groundhogs are true hibernators. If you were to dig into a, a groundhog's den, you could actually pick that animal up and it wouldn't move, it wouldn't wake up. You could roll it along, you could do all sorts of things, but unlike bears, groundhogs have to eat during the winter. So every three or four weeks, the groundhog starts to shiver and it stretches and then it goes for a walk inside its den. And it's got two little spaces in the den. One, it's stored food in and the other is the washroom. So it goes to the bathroom, gets something to eat and goes back to hibernating. Now, the groundhogs that predict groundhog day and the weather, those groundhogs are almost always males. They emerge from the den in the winter 
not to see if winter's going to last, but to see if they can find a female because this is their breeding season. They need to breed so that the baby groundhogs, which will be born in the den once the warmer weather comes, have had enough time to develop inside their mother that when they're born, she's able to go out and feed on grass and get to produce the milk they need. So there's a real method to what goes on. Beavers, of which I've been working with a number of them in Mississauga in the area in the last year or so, they face another problem with winter, ice. They live in a den and if their ponds or rivers get covered with ice, they can't get out or they can't get up very easily. So what they do is during this fall, they will collect branches and they'll stuff it around their lodges. And if you go to look at a beaver lodge, you will see the buildup of all of these branches very close to them. There's one at Sam Smith that really illustrates this. That's at the foot of Kipling Avenue in Toronto. And you can see it's, it's kitchen, it's, it's food pantry right there. And what they can do is they can swim out from their lodge under the water, get a branch and bring it back into the lodge where they can eat it. They will push up through the ice and it isn't very thick. In fact, I watched one do that yesterday. Um, but they have solved the problem by storing food. But food is, again, an issue. Sometimes in the winter, beavers will emerge from the lakes, the ponds, the rivers, if, if they're able to, to get fresh food or at least new food. This is a very dangerous time for them. This is when wolves start to prey on them. And the wolves up in Algonquin Park do consume quite a few beavers. And black bears have actually been known, so grizzlies, to break through the lodge to get to the beavers inside the lodge. But that happens in the spring, of course. Now, closer to home, this may be happening in your backyard. <clears throat> Once the snow builds up, if you see tiny little holes about yay big, <clears throat> in the snow, that's probably the work of the metal wolf. And this animal eats grass <clears throat> and he'll travel, make little trails underneath the snow or in the grass, and he will come and feed here and there. And where the trails cross, they leave their droppings and the droppings are a signpost for other voles saying, oh, so-and-so has been here. But every now and again, when we get an icy day, then the air gets trapped in there and they have to come up through these holes to get fresh air in to, to their uh, breeding area, the living area. Now, meadow voles breed pretty much every month but February. In February, it's just too cold. And in February, their population goes down because owls and coyotes and fox and hawks have all been hunting them. There are fewer meadow voles around in February because they're not having babies. So what we tend to see in February and early March, that's the best time to see foxes and coyotes out during the day because they're hungry, they're desperate, and that's the time you wanna go and take a drive in the country because you might see some of these animals. All because of this little guy who looks like a mouse, but he doesn't have Mickey Mouse's big ears. So he's out there. And this of course is one of the animals that are preying on. The great horned owl nest probably as early as any bird in Mississauga and the southern GTA, probably it is the earliest nester we have. It nests when there's still snow on the ground. So they'll be sitting on the nest very shortly if they're not already. They nest because they want to time the arrival of their owlets with the arrival of the spring migration. So by nesting early, nesting in the cold of winter and having to sit out on that branch when the wind is blowing, you know, it makes sense because they're going to be ready for when food, fresh food arrives. And she will have a helper, her husband, her male, who will be going around and he will bring food to her. Another bird that nests early is the Canada Jay. Now, if you've ever been up to Algonquin Park, you've probably seen the whiskey jacks that come and feed out of your hand. They too have a problem with food, but they solve it by storing food. So what happens is they give birth to they lay two eggs, one egg hatches. If it's healthy, it will push the other egg out of the nest. 
and then the parents have only one offspring to feed, and that offspring they will feed until the summer, and then they try and hide from that offspring. They do not want that baby to see where they're hiding their food, but the baby, of course, wants to see where they're hiding their food. So it tries to follow mom and dad. So they try and all sorts of elaborate tricks, but that's the food they're going to rely on during the cold of winter because there is no other food available for them unless they go to a bird feeder. The youngster tries to steal the food. And when they have a nest and they've got two eggs in it, last year's youngster will sometimes actually come in and try and knock the other two eggs out. Food being the, the driving factor there. Now, if you see a moose in the winter, which you'd have to go north to see, and if you see snow on your back, on its back, that's a healthy moose. And the same is true with you. If you're outside and your jacket's got snow on it and it's not melting, then your jacket's doing the job. If the moose was unhealthy and the snow was melting off of its back, that would tell you that the body heat from the moose is not being held in, it's going out and it's melting the snow. And speaking of the snow, one of the other things that miss, is missing in winter is water. You look around, you see all this snow, and you think, wow, there's a lot of water. But wait a second, you can't drink it. And if you want to drink it, you've got to eat it. And if you eat it, it's going to go into your system, and it's cold, and it's going to take heat from your system and cool you down. So moose are big enough bodied animals that they can afford to do this. But a human being could not afford to eat snow very long without getting very, very sick. So I warn you against that. It works for moose. It doesn't work for humans. You notice on the top of this moose's head, it's got like two sort of look like holes. That's where its anthers used to be. Let's talk about that for a second. We think of antlers as being something to defend the moose or the caribou or the deer against predators. In fact, the antlers are mainly used in battles to determine who's got the right to mate with the female. It's a way of arm wrestling with their heads and their antlers, pushing back and forth until the stronger one is decided and the weaker one runs off. All of the male deer eventually lose their antlers and they lose them fairly quickly with the exception of elk. Elk can keep their antlers on until the end of March, early April. But among caribou, reindeer, the females keep their antlers. Now they're one of the few deer that actually grow antlers. So the reindeer or the caribou, the female has her antlers and she keeps them much longer than the males. Because by having antlers on her head, it bestows a bit of status to her. She is able to dominate other animals. So a male who is bigger and healthier with the big antlers, once he loses his antlers, she can dominate him. She can get him to move away from a food source. And that's important because she's got a young calf growing inside her. So she will keep her antlers. But female reindeer and caribou are the only members of the deer family where the female regularly grows antlers. This is the native deer you can see around the GTA. This is the white-tailed deer. And white-tailed bucks grow their antlers starting in April. They use them during the, the fall rut to fight other males. And honestly, size matters. If a, a doe sees a male or a cow moose sees a big male with big antlers, they know that this guy has been successful in finding food. He's in this prime. He would make a good father for their unborn um, calves or fawns. But as soon as winter comes, like January, the white-tailed deer start to lose their antlers. And you can see in this one, which I photographed in Texas, it's got a lot of blood showing in its head. The antlers are grown by blood that bring up the cells and it grows underneath the skin and gradually the antler grows and they grow them every year. And that's unusual. It's only antler animals that do that. Horned animals, with one exception, horned animals keep their horns for their life. A male deer in the winter has no antlers. And this is why we know, one of the reasons we know, 
that they don't use them for protection against wolves and coyotes. They don't have them and they need them most in the winter. So they drop them and they'll actually eat them because food is short and the antlers contain calcium. So quite often you'll find antlers that are gnawed on by porcupines and by mice, but also by deer themselves. Another trick that deer do in the winter is they form yards. They live together. We call this as a behavior, the selfish herd. By getting into a herd, you have all of these eyes that are on the lookout for predators or hunters. You also have among the deer, the stronger will break the trail through the deep snow and the weaker can follow them. And if you go into a deer yard, you will see this labyrinth of trails going around and around. And if a wolf or a coyote comes in, the deer can follow those trails and run the wolf or the coyote. Uh, it's a very healthy thing. Now, you'll notice the deer are lying down in the snow. That is to conserve warmth. The snow protects them against the wind. Wind is one of the worst things. We talk about wind chill factors. Deer do not like the wind. Most animals don't, you don't probably. So by going into heavy brush like these deer or underneath pine trees, they protect themselves from the wind. It doesn't matter that it's colder underneath the pine trees because there's no sun. What matters is there's no wind chill and that really protects them. And the other thing deer do is their metabolism slows down. So people like to feed deer, feeding in January is one thing, but we don't suggest that you feed in February or March, early March anyhow, because the deer have gone into a toper there. They're not hibernating, but they're really taking it easy and they're not using much energy and they're not using much food up. And they're doing other things too. Water is a big problem. So animals like cottontail rabbits and deer, moose, they produce very dry droppings. They don't urinate very much. Their droppings are very dry. In the summer when they have a lot of moisture, the droppings are quite wet. But by having dry droppings, they're conserving moisture. So animals do all sorts of really neat things to cope with winter. But what drives them? Lack of food. So if you don't have it, you store it like the groundhogs do, or you migrate to get it, or you go to sleep. Water, black bears recycle their urine and are able to get, make fatty products out of it. Um, deer and rabbits try and keep it dry. Water is a big problem. And then there's protection against predators. Um, and then there's the whole notion of keeping warm by throwing extra coats and trying to find shelter. And all in all, if that, those things don't work, winter is a bottleneck. So you have all these animals coming in, whether it's deer or rabbits, winter comes along, the healthy ones will get through this bottleneck of winter and they will survive. The ones that are weak, sick, injured, didn't get enough food to eat before winter came on, those are the ones who don't get through the bottleneck and die. And this is part of nature. It gets rid of the weak animals. So these the concept of a bottleneck is really important. Winter is a bottleneck. Droughts are a bottleneck. Um, abrupt changes in the environment are bottlenecks. But winter in our system is probably the most natural occurring. And that takes us to the end of the slideshow. And I'm going to ask Stephanie to share some questions and we'll try and answer them. Yeah, for sure. Great presentation, Dave. Thank you so much. And um, if anybody has any questions for Dave, you can write them in the Q&A chat or on Facebook as well. I'm reviewing the Facebook chat as well. We're having a lot of great feedback for you, Dave. Um, there's 21 students actually watching from an Orangeville school, I believe, called Montgomery Village Public School. Um, hey there. 21 students watching you right now. Um, we also have uh, Susan who said, thoroughly enjoying this, thank you. And as well, I think it's Yusra said, my four-year-old and myself are hardcore animal lovers and are thoroughly enjoying this webinar. Thank you. So that's awesome. We do have- I want to give a shout out to uh, Benavale Village Public School because I think uh, my daughter and her class are watching. So hi to them as well. Awesome. And we actually have uh, 10 students from 
Hillside Public School, uh, they're kindergartners um, oh. who are watching as well, which is great. Um, okay, Welcome. so first tough question for you, Dave. Do black bears in your area eat skunk cabbage upon awakening from hibernation? Supposed to act as a laxative to get them moving. That's what. Uh, that's a question by uh, Randy. I, I, my understanding is yes, they do. Okay. They all, anything that's greening up in the spring is fair food for black bears. And, and the reason why they eat the things in the, in the spring when it's fresh is these plants haven't had a chance to develop the toxins that eventually would upset the bear's stomach. So they're great at following what we call green up. Uh, it's the, probably some of the best food of the year. Awesome. Uh, Vivian has asked, did Dave take those pictures or did he find them online? <laughs> I am a professional wildlife photographer, so I don't use other people's pictures. <laughs> they're all mine. And often when I do webinars too, I have to use Dave's photos because <laughs> I'm, I'm not as did. experienced as him. <laughs> uh, Gail has asked, squirrels frequent my balcony and I put out water for them so they don't, don't have to drink from the road puddles. Is this important? Water is very important for uh, animals throughout the year and snow is a problem because it, it takes a lot of energy. Now, squirrels have adapted to eat snow and they get enough, but putting out fresh water probably is not a bad thing. It's not going to hurt the squirrels. And yeah, I, I, I can't see a reason for doing it, uh, or for not doing it rather. It's, it seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. Um, but I wouldn't worry about it. If you've missed a day, the squirrel isn't going to die of thirst. In fact, squirrels, Two will go into a bit of toper and they will go into their uh, their drays, these leafy nests, and they'll stay warm. Uh, like I wouldn't expect to see very many squirrels out on a day like today. But you never know, they can surprise you. And I think we have four other schools that are actually watching. Um, if you guys want to show or share with us um, how many students are in each of your classes, that would be great so that we can record those numbers. Um, Dave has a lot of great followers today, which is awesome. Uh, Jillian has asked, how do raccoons survive in the winter, Dave? Well, they don't hibernate. A lot of people think they do. But what they do do is they go to sleep and they sleep uh, most of the winter away. And a mother with young baby raccoons, they will get crowded into a, a den, like in a log or <laughs> I hope not in your ceiling. And they will stay quite close together. So they keep warm. And uh, that's really important. The same sort of thing that a lot of wasps do. They will go and they will form a, in the cracks of a rock, they'll all nest together. The ones outside freeze, but the ones that are in towards the core of it where the queen is, they will stay warm. So raccoons take that same thing. Now, a male raccoon is usually big enough and bulky enough that he can survive. And if you look around, once you get a bit milder weather, you'll start to see male raccoon tracks because he'll start going around looking for a female to breed because they also breed in February and March. So their babies are ready when the food sources start to come back online. So they're active, but they are not really hibernating, they're in a sleep. Chipmunks hibernate. Great, so you're getting a lot more questions. We'll, we'll answer yeah, a couple question. more if that's okay with you, Dave. Yeah. Um, Yu Yu, who is nine years old um, from Port P Perry, um, said, Hi. thanks Dave, please can you tell me about how female deer defend, defend themselves without antlers? Um, deer fight with their feet. So if two does or a doe and a buck um, get into a fight, they will rear up and they'll kick at each other. And they're, they can have quite a force. If a coyote comes along or whatever, they will attack them and kick them. So it's with their feet. And that's the primary use. There was a great video that circulated a few years ago. A moose had gotten trapped in a, a wire snare and a bunch of ministry people from Ministry of Natural Resources 
they were trying to free it and they were trying to help the animal. Well, one guy got too close and the calamoose hit him with her back foot and she sent him literally 10 meters flying. He was okay. I think he broke a river so. They're very powerful. So the feet are the most dangerous part. Now, against a wolf, the feet aren't gonna do very much. Uh, and there are cases where deer have used their antlers against predators, but it is very, very rare. So it's mostly kicking out with their feet, just like horses would do, just like most animals would do. Awesome. We and have good question. Yeah, we have another really good question. How do we think climate change will impact these animals in the winter? If it gets too mild, will they need will they still need to hibernate? And if not, does not hibernating harm some of the animals? Well, first of all, bears hibernate in Florida. So what we talk about with animal behavior is plasticity. Some animals um, are very plastic in their behavior, which means they can bend, they can mold, but they can change. So black bear and a wild deer have what we call very plastic behaviors. They are able to adapt to changing climates pretty well. Other animals are not so plastic. And you just have to look back in the past, about 12,000 years ago, we had woolly mammoths and mastodons living here. They were unable to cope with the abrupt climate change. And that's one of the main reasons they became extinct. So everybody is wondering, well, how is climate change going to affect the animals now. So for instance, birds migrating from the south coming north, are they going to come up earlier or later? And what if the insects haven't come out? Um, these are all problems that are real concerns, but you also have to remember that 12,000 years ago, we were going through an ice age and this was really, the climate was changing very rapidly and these animals were able to adapt and survive. So I think there is some hope that a lot of species are going to be able to find their own behavior to be flexible enough to survive climate change. Um, you know, some animals also have long lives. So there, there's a documentary on by David Attenborough and one of the parts talks about these turtles in the Amazon and they rely on the river receding so that they have this wild wide sand bank to lay their eggs. And every four years, that bank is flooding. It used to flood every 10 years. So the concern is these turtles are going to have their homes and their eggs washed away. But these turtles are long lived. So if a turtle lives 30, 40 years, it can survive a couple of disasters. It's how often those disasters happen. Um, so there isn't really a set response. Uh, some animals are going to do fine. Some animals are going to uh, not do so well. Uh, one of the animals that we're seeing a decline in numbers is the moose, and nobody really knows why. It could be climate change related. It could be just changes in the environment. We don't know. Um, White-tailed deer, on the other hand, their numbers are getting higher. Black bear numbers are higher than ever. Grizzly bears are expanding their range. Polar bears are a species of concern, but polar bears have been through these contractions before, so they may just be able to survive. What we can do is make sure they have places to survive in, like uh, conservation areas and places like Riverwood and national parks and areas where wildlife is still welcome, and that helps a lot. So. No set answer and there's no simple answer and you can't point to too many species and say this one's really a trouble, uh, a worry, but I think I think we're going to be okay, but we'd have to live about 200 years to know that for sure. Okay, and we're going to try to get to two more questions. There are so many questions up right now and we're going to try to answer them um, after the stream as well. Um, one of these questions is, uh, how do skunks survive in the winter and why do we see foxes so often in the winter time? That's coming from Lisa. Skunks pretty much sleep the winter through. Um, if you see a skunk in the winter, my experience has been it's because its den has been flooded 
and the poor Drago critter is out wandering around. Uh, that changes a bit if there's a lot of food sources available, and that could change for any animal. If you put out food that skunks like, you might see skunks around because they rely on the food. But if you do feed animals, you've got to keep it up during the winter. You can't feed today and then forget about it tomorrow. Um, the other species you asked about was foxes. Red foxes, um, there's been a lot of sightings reported. Unfortunately, I haven't seen any of these foxes, but I hear about them uh, in Mississauga. Uh, this is the breeding season. This is when the males and females are sorting out um, who they're going to mate with and who they're going to partner with. It's also the season when a lot of young foxes are wandering around finding, trying to find a home. And these foxes can travel upwards to 150 kilometers from where they're born. They disperse. So that's probably part of why you're seeing foxes. The other thing I think that's going on is I kind of feel that the coyote population has declined a little bit in Mississauga. We have lots of coyotes, but I think there's fewer of them right now because of mange and other problems. And when that happens, the fox population survives because coyotes view foxes as competitors and will kill them. And when you start to see foxes a lot, and this has been an unusual year because I've heard a lot more about foxes. Uh, they, I think they're up because there are fewer coyotes. Now, certainly Riverwood, we've been seeing coyotes fairly regularly the last little while. We haven't been seeing foxes, but I've heard of fox sightings all around Riverwood. So there may be something going on that I am not aware of. In fact, I'm sure there's lots of things going on I'm not aware of. But the, uh, the fox coyote thing is an interesting dynamic. And the other thing is if you live in an area where foxes are well established, it could very well mean there are no coyotes in that area. And foxes have adapted really well for living with people. They'll live on, they'll, I've seen dens on top of people's garages. I've seen them denning in under old buildings. They're, they're quite happy to live with people as long as there's like no coyotes around. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing. There's no real set answer. Uh, but I, 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 would, I would say this too. If you see a fox in your area or a coyote, don't worry about rabies. They did a uh, killed vaccine rabies drop a year, two, two years ago, I think now. And rabies is pretty much eliminated as a factor in our area. It's not likely to happen. If you get bit by a fox or a dog or a skunk or whatever, you, well, absolutely, you got to be tested for rabies. But a healthy fox trotting down your street in the middle of the day, nothing to worry about. Enjoy it. Appreciate the beauty. I would. I get my camera and follow it. And Dave, and we have uh, one more question. Yeah. Um, so I am going to ask this question um, from the grade four and five class from St. Rose of Lima. Um, they said you had beautiful photographs and you're extremely informative. All true. Uh, we are wondering if there's particular animal along the Credit River that is most at, at risk because of climate change. Huh, that's a really good question. Hard question, eh? <laughs> I would say it would probably be an amphibian. Um, uh, the American toad comes to mind. Oh, there's lots of them, but we have been losing amphibians throughout Southern Ontario. And I think that, that one of the reasons the scientists are pointing to is um, climate change, bringing in new funguses, new diseases that these animals are not able to cope with. The other one I would say is the uh, little brown bat because there's been this fungus that has gotten into its den, its lodging areas up in, on the Hamilton Escarpment and its numbers have been declining. Um, so, Almost certainly, though, I would go with an amphibian. Maybe some fish, particularly to the Credit River as the, the Credit River warms. But really, the Credit River is pretty, pretty healthy. It's a lot better than it was 50 years ago. So, but we have certainly lost species. And some of the species we know we've lost at Riverwood have been uh, frogs and toads, uh, particularly the uh, gray tree frog. 
Uh, the leopard frog seems to be disappearing. Used to see the occasional bullfrog. Don't see them anymore. Uh, spring peepers are completely gone. But some of these animals didn't die out because of climate change. They died out because they couldn't bear to be around people. Well, no said answer. But you'll find when you study wildlife, people that have definitive answers probably haven't done enough homework. So if I've, you know, I'm always reading books, as you can see behind me, and I find that my answers change. So what I would have said 10 years ago probably would be quite different to what I'm saying today. And 10 years from now, if I'm still doing this, my answers may have changed again. I want to thank all of the schools that uh, have joined us. Uh, it's really great. I hope we've helped. This will be online as well for you to share. And you can always visit my website. If you want to find my uh, YouTube channel, look up Cranky Beavers. That seems to be the one that uh, people are finding easiest. And it's kind of a cute video. Thank you very much for your time. And we will try and answer other questions as well. Yeah. And Stephanie, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave, for all of your information and your expertise. And um, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions. We have 11 questions lined up in Zoom and I think another uh, 10 or 11 in Facebook as well. So we'll try to answer the ones on Facebook. And if you have any further questions, you can always email either Dave or myself and we can try to get to those. Um, once again, thank you very much, Dave. And thank you everyone for watching. Uh, you should tell us our email address. So I can be reached at education at the Riverwood Conservancy.org. And I can be reached at stephanie.keeler at the Riverwood Conservancy.org as well. And I think we can, you can find both of our emails up on our website too. Um, so stay tuned uh, for all the future events that we have. And once again, if you do have the financial means to support this kind of programming going forward, we would really, really appreciate it. You can give at the Riverwood Conservancy.org. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Stay safe and we will see you soon. Goodbye. Bye-bye.